think our last is yeah this is our last exercise ever yeah but it will be a long one yes so we're doing sample proportions let's read through all the stuff so it says so far we have recorded the results of a binomial experiment as the number of successes often however it is more interesting to record instead the proportion of the Bernoulli trials that were successes this is called the sample proportion. Sample proportions have many purposes. One important purpose is to estimate the probability P of each Bernoulli trial in the Bernoulli experiment. So for a sample pro proportion, we're saying let X be equal to the binomial where we have N and P be a binomial variable consisting of n independent Bernoulli trials, each with a probability of p successes. The sample proportion, we're going to be using this notation, the p with the little u hat on top, is the proportion of successes when the experiment is run. Thus, the sample proportion is a new random variable denoted by the p hat and is defined by the x divided by the number of scores. Okay, so we'll be having to calculate that. The values of the sample proportion are the n plus 1 values of 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n. It's n plus 1 because if you're starting at 0, that's your extra um, value there. So the value of x divided by n, thus the values of p hat are going to be from 0 all the way through to 1. Okay, because n over n is going to be equal to 1. And you actually have dots in there. Sorry that that's changed this. That should be dot, dot, dot. So each of your scores, so 0 divided by n, 1 divided by n, 2 divided by n, and so on, all the way until n divided by n, which is equal to 1. The probability of each value of p hat equals the probability of the corresponding value of x. So we have our same formula there for ncx equals the probability to the power of x successes and q n minus x. Hello, welcome, welcome. We started without you. Morning. Afternoon. The mean and variance and standard deviation of the sample proportion are calculated a little bit differently. So don't get these messed up with the other ones that we've been doing. The expected value, which is the mean, remember, of p hat is just equal to the probability of the success, just p. Okay, the variance is p q over n, which means to get the standard deviation, we would have to square root p q over n or n p q over n actually works out to be the same thing. So there's two different expressions there for standard deviation, really. The sample proportion gives an estimate of the probability of P. The sample proportion P hat can often be used to estimate the probability of obtaining an acceptable estimate to the probability of P Bernoulli experiment. Okay, so that's all the theory part and the formulas that we're going to be using. Let's have a look at our questions. Question number one, a coin is tossed six times. Let x be the Bernoulli variable and p hat the corresponding sample proportion random variable. Tabulate the probabilities of x, find the mean and variance, and draw the frequency polygon. Okay, so we have our coin that is tossed six times. The probability um, for success, I was just trying to look to see if we we're going for heads or tails, but it doesn't seem to say. But if we were going for heads, the probability of success would be a half, wouldn't it? So to calculate the probabilities of zero heads occurring, we would use our formula. We have six and we want C zero. And then it would be half to the power of 
zero and then half to the power of six. So in other words, it's always gonna be half to the power of six. If you type that in, yes. Now, because, thank you. Um, so I actually had them in as fractions, one over 64, but we are going to have to sketch this on a histogram. And it's pretty hard to sketch fractions. So it might also be good to write that down as a decimal, which is 0 0.02. Okay, then you would just do the next one. So you go 6C1, half to the power of 6. It's always going to be half to the power of 6 because however many failures and successes there are, it's going to make 6. Do you have your booklet, Isaac? All right, well, you're just listening to the AFM. All right, so you want to type in the next one? Anyone with their calculators? Yep, so 3 on 32 as a decimal, that is good. Okay, then change it to 6C1, uh, 62, sorry, we're up to now. So just back arrow and changing it to a 2. Would that be the same as 3C1? They will be symmetrical, 3C1. Yeah, but it's 2C6. No, it's not the same. Six. No, it's not the same. So that one should be 0 0.23. Do you want me just to tell you the rest? As long as you know how to calculate them, it's just changing that bottom number. So 5 over 16, which is 0 0.31. Then it's symmetrical, so we're back to 15 over 64, which is 0 0.23. 3 over 32, 0 0.09. And 6 over 6, 1 over 64 for the 6, which is 0 0.02. Okay, we filled in the table, but we've also been asked to find the mean and the variance. The mean is another name for expected value of x. What is the mean? How do I find the mean from this? This is not sample proportion yet. How do you find the mean? From before, it was n times p. That was the formula we had from previous lessons, right? Mm. So what is the N in my experiment? And I've got six, six coins. So it's six times a half, which means three, which is the center of my data. So that makes sense. Then our variance is calculated with NPQ. So that's six times a half times a half which is three over two or one and a half. Um, okay, we've found checking, we have found, we finished the table to find the probabilities, we found the mean, we found the variance. So the next thing we need to do, do is draw a frequency polygon, which is what this space under here is for. So to sketch that along the bottom axis, we're going to have the X values and we're sketching the probability on the vertical axis. So our probabilities, our x values, sorry, go from zero to six. It's a polygon, so it's a line graph polygon. Okay, so across the bottom, if you use one centimeter spaces, anyone need a ruler? No, they do not. Just keep them even. So this is my x axis and the vertical one is my probability of x equals x. And my biggest probability if I look at the decimals was 0 0.31. So how about we just go up by 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Okay, so sketching the polygon, when x is equal to 0, the probability is 0 0.02. So that's like a fifth of that 0.1 down there, pretty small. When x equals 1, we have 0 0.09, which is just under the 0 0.1. When x equals 2, we have 0 0.23. I'm going to put that about there. 3 is 0.31. 4 is 0.23 again, 
and then 0.9 again, and then 0 0.02. It's, uh, it's not a curve, make sure it's a polygon, so do lines in between, not curves. Polygons are meant to be straight line segments. But yes, it does look very nice and symmetrical, doesn't it? Okay. All right. So we've done that part. Now in the next one, this is where we get to the sample part. So that, that was all stuff that we've done in previous lesson, finding those probabilities um, and the mean and the variance. But now in this one, you'll see we have this proportion, sample proportion symbol in here. Do you remember back on that past page, the formula for, to find the sample proportion was to take the x value and divide it by the number. Okay, that was the formula that was on that previous page. So this is still to do with the same, I'll shrink this down so we can see it up here, still to do with this same result. So if x is equal to zero originally, for the first one, and I have six scores, so six times that we're doing this, I'm doing zero divided by six, right? Which is still zero for this one. Then when x is equal to one, I'm doing one divided by six. x is equal to two will be two divided by six. x is equal to three will be three divided by six. And then four divided by six, five divided by six, and six divided by six is obviously one. I know there's a few fractions in there that could simplify, but just keeping it simple. Okay, the probability of each of those things is the same as before. You don't have to do anything different over there. So this is still going to be, I'll write the decimals down. It's 0 0.02, 0 0.09, 0 0.23, 0 0.31, 0 0.23, 0 0.09, and 0 0.02. So it's probability is still the same. Okay, but what is different about the expected value or the mean of that sample proportion and the variance? Okay, again, looking back to the previous page, the expected value of a sample proportion is equal to what? I'm going to have to tell you, Anna. It's just equal to P, the probability. And what is the probability of my coin? Yeah, it's just one out of two. And the variance, there was a formula for that as well for a sample. It is P, Q over N. So P is a half, Q is also going to be a half, and N is six. So it's one on 24, very good. And hopefully looking at the expected value, you remember how I said for this one, the mean was equal to three and here's my mean in there, nice, my symmetrical curve, nice there in the center. And this one here, what's in the middle of my table here? There is three over six, which is a half. Okay, so it does make sense that these formulas are working with these proportion, sample proportions. So let's draw this one. We want to draw the polygon for this, which is very similar. You're just going to have the, the um, sample proportion on the bottom instead of the x value, and you're still going to have the probability going up the vertical axis. So, two, three, four, five, six. So it'll be one, six, two, six, three, six. Four, six, five, six, and one. And this is for my sample proportion. And then my probabilities, I'm going to be going up by 0 0.1 again. Okay, so this is still probability. And it's the same graph. So it's 0 0.2, 0 0.02 then 0 0.9, 26 is 0 0.23, 
three six is point three one, four six is point two three, five six is point nine, and one is the point zero two. <laughs> Okay, all right. Starting a new type of question. So we've been able to see that the sample probability is pretty much the same as calculating the probability normally, which is why taking a sample is sometimes a good thing. Question two. A binomial experiment with 20 Bernoulli trials is being used to estimate the probability P of success of the Bernoulli experiment. If the actual value of P is one third, find the probability that the experiment will yield an estimate within 0 0.05 of the actual value. Okay, so um, probability, we're told, is one third. Um, as a decimal, that's approximately equal to 0 0.333 and so on. Um, we have 20 trials, 20 experiments that we're doing here, and we want things, it has to be a multiple of three successes, right? And three doesn't divide nicely into 20. So we need to try and find which numbers are going to be between 0 0.05 less than the 0.3 and 0 0.05 more. So, um, for example, if I were to take something like, I'm going to start with a low number, if I did 2 over 20, okay, which is 0 0.1, that is 0 0.233 away from the value that I want. That's too big a gap, isn't it? So how, many, how much do I have to increase that top number by? So if I go to 4 over 20, that's 0.2. Am I now within a 0 0.05 of that number? Nope, still too far away. So I've got to keep five, I've got to try and find, it's actually six, because when I get to six, I'm at 0 0.3. That is only 0 0.03 away from that, right? So it's now within the range that I want to be in. So I can take six over 20, as a possible solution because that's equal to 0 0.3 so that's an acceptable range there's actually another one that works it's seven that's right because seven over 20 is 0 0.35 which is only just you know 0 0.02 above that value right so we have one just slightly below one slightly above my 0.333 but they are both within the 0 0.05 error, if you like, from what I'm actually after. So if I want to find the probability of those two things, that's what I'm after. The probability of um, a p hat of 6 out of 20 or sample proportion of 7 out of 20 is going to be equal to and we calculate this with our Bernoulli formula. If I want six successes out of the 20, it's going to be 20 C6. The probability of success is a third, so it's going to be a third to the power of six and two thirds to the power of 14, because 20 minus six is 14. Okay, then we wanna to add to that seven successes. So we go 20 C7, one third to the power of seven, which means two thirds to the power of 13. Okay, and then you can try to type all that in your calculator. Should I just tell you the answers? I'm seeing that motivation is extremely high today. <laughs> that was a little bit of sarcasm. <laughs> 
Was that both of them? That wasn't what I got. Was that just the first one? Or was it both of them added together? Oh, I added them both together. So together it should be 0. 0.3642 with small. That goes on from there, but they're the first few decimal places. Okay. Keeping that process in mind, what happens if we then give ourselves a bit more wiggle room and we can be within 0. 0.1 of the actual value? How many things in my sample proportion are within 0. 0.1 of my actual value. So point one would be anything, sorry? Uh, say again, sorry again. So it'd be point two, three, three would be the lowest value. So anything from point two, three, three to, and to be underneath point four, three, three. So have a look through your fractions. What's the first one that's going to be five because five is 0.25 which is above 0.233 right so the first one we want is p hat of five over 20 because that's 0 0.25 okay that's what else is going to work the six and the seven are still going to work so we also have six because that's 0.3, that's definitely still within. And the seven from before. But what about the eight? Does the eight work? Yep, because eight is 0 0.4, which is still less than 0 0.1 above, isn't it? If you went to nine, nine over 20, okay. that's 0 0.45, so it's just slightly above. Point one, so we can't use that. So they're the four that we want. We have already worked out two of them, so that saves us a little bit of working out. But just to have everything together, the probability, I'm not going to write all those things, the notation down, the probability is going to be equal to 20C5, one third to the power of five, two thirds to the power of 15. And then you're going to do that for each of the four things. So plus, 20C6, one third to the power of six, two thirds to the power of 14. 20C7, one third to the power of seven, two thirds to the power of 13. And 20C8, one third to the power of eight, two thirds to the power of 12. which means that you have a 0 0.658 chance of getting something between 0.1, within 0.1 of your actual value. Okay, question, we okay so far? Question three sounds very similar, but there's a small difference. A survey of 2,000 Australian voters is being used to estimate the probability P that a random voter will vote for the Working Together Party. Assuming that the actual value of P is a third, use the normal approximation. See that? Normal approximation. That's what we were doing last lesson. Use the normal approximation to the sample proportion to find the probability that the experiment will yield an estimate. Because you can imagine if there was quite, I mean, we did one there with four and even that was painful enough. If you have too many things that are between wherever you're looking, you don't want to sit there and have to add heaps and heaps and heaps of things together. And that's where the normal distribution becomes so much more useful because especially for big samples, it is um, quite accurate, right? Yeah. So I've lost you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're doing a very similar experiment, except we're going to use the normal approximation to do it now instead of using our Bernoulli trial formula. Okay, so we are still wanting to find, oh, it's not quite the same, 0 0.01 from the actual value. So remember that my probability is one third so the probability, but the probability in a sample is the same as your mean. 
okay? So that is equal to the one third or the 0 0.33 whatever decimal places. The variance for a sample is found by N, not N, sorry, P, Q over N. So for this one, it's going to be one third times two thirds over 2,000 because there was 2,000 uh, workers that we're surveying here. That equals one over 9,000. Okay, because so we're going... Uh, no, this, well, P, no, it's not the sample portion yet. Not yet. P is the probability. The P hat is the sample proportion. They are two different things. So they just use the same thing. Like no, it's not the same formula. There weren't any hats in any of those formulas. Uh, oh, the variance of P hat. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, okay, yes, yes, all right. Okay, yes. All right, so back to what we were doing. Because we're going to be using a normal approximation, what am I going to need? What are all the things that you're given to use those tables? Z scores. We need Z scores, which means I will need the standard deviation so that I can do that. So the standard deviation is going to be the square root of that one over 9,000. So square root of one over 9,000 is that terrible little number. So 0 0.0105. Oh, as in you want, it won't, it won't, it won't change into fractions. Okay, so I am wanting to find the probability of my sample proportion, my probability has to be between 0.333, right? But for it to be within 0 0.01, so I'm going to go uh, 0 0.323, because you're taking off 0 0.1, and then add on 0 0.1 would be 0 0.3. 343, three. there would be more decimal places if I needed them, but um, can't do that many places anyway. Those are the sample proportions, but I need those as Z scores. How do I change those scores into Z scores? We use our Z score formula, which is... X, X minus. Yeah. That one. So there's no room to show those calculations, but what you're typing in is my score is 0 0.323. I'm subtracting off my, my mean, which is 0 0.333, and I'm dividing that by my standard deviation, which is 0 0.0105. And there it is. So negative, how many decimal places can we do in those tables? Just two, or well, the one that in the, in the booklet is only two, I'm pretty sure. No, it gives you four out, but to put in, have a look back through your booklet. Yes, I'm pretty sure it's two. So to two decimal places, we're going to have probability, and this time it's going to be, I'm changing them into Z scores. So that's going to be minus 0 0.95. When you do the other one, so change to be in your calculator, just change that little 2 up there to be a 4. And it's the positive. Okay, so which makes sense because we're finding 0 0.01 on either side of our value there. Okay. How I'll go to your table now, and you need to tell me, read off. We can't do negative 0.95, so what's your strategy here? 
if we can find 0.95 to the mean, maybe, and then times it by two. So zero point, what was it? Okay, and then I'm just going to times that by two. So two lots of that. Uh, well, my, let me tell you, should I got for the final answer was 0 0.6578. Um, Is that right? That looks right? Yeah, that's right. Oh, great. Well done. Okay, now we want to do that again within 0 0.02 of the actual value. We can repeat that process, can't we? The mean and the standard deviation are still the same thing, but I don't need to work those out again. But now we're just changing where we're looking between. So I'm gonna go straight to my probability line. My P hat is gonna be between what values? So I need to subtract, zero. subtract off 0 0.02, which is 0 0.313, yep. And then add on the 0 0.02 would be 0 0.353. Change those into Z scores using the Z score formula. And it will be Z scores between, and you're typing in uh, numbers, yes. 0.313 minus 0.333 over the standard deviation, which is 0 0.05, 0105. So to two decimal places, minus 1.90. And yeah, positive 1.90 on the other side. Then you go to your table and you read off what is the Z score for the positive 1.90 going to the mean, and then we can double it. Anyone other than Logan know how to read this table? <laughs> you just don't want to. One point nine. Yep. Yep. And then when you times that by two, our final answer is 0 0.9426. Yep. We feel very close. Wait, uh, wouldn't it be 0 0.95? Oh, well, oh, 95. Yeah, 0 0.9526, not 0 0.94, because it's yeah, but the nine gets times by two, so that would add one to the four. So that'd be nice. What nine? What nine? Look up, Ashton. There you go. It's in the calculator. It's one then, not nine. Um, but, I think you said zero. But that's actually saying that 94%, over 94% of the results are within 0 0.02 of the actual value. That's because these scores aren't very spread out. They're actually quite all quite close together. Question four. An election, oh, this is a wordy question. Election surveys usually claim that their margin of error is about 2%. And the last worked example has addressed this. What are some other issues that pollsters need to take into account? So if you were running an election and you're making this claim that there's 2% error, which is the 0 0.02 that we just worked out, um, what are some of the problems that you would need to be mindful of if you were the person doing the data collecting? There's a bunch of things you could think about. Here's a list. Sorry, what was that? Fraudulent votes, way to make things biased, way to, yes. So um, first of all, if you're choosing a sample, because that was a sample probability that we just did, you have to make sure that the sample that you're choosing is not biased. Okay, so first of all, ask yourself, is the sample biased? Because if it is, then they can't claim their 2% error. What does that mean? Um, are people answering honestly? Yeah. 
You know, so they ring people up on the phone and go, oh, who are you going to vote for in the next election? Are you going to vote for this person? You need to vote for this person. Please vote for this person. You know, they might be trying to, re you oh, know. Yes. Okay. Um, some people are going to change their mind. You know, stuff happens in the election. They might ring up and do a poll, but they might actually change their mind of who they're going to vote for before the election act actually happens. Do people change their mind? Yes, they do. So they might have planned to vote for someone else and then someone brought out some new policies or some stuff happens to me. Oh, actually, I don't want to vote for them anymore. I'm going to vote for somebody else instead. Um, there are always people, you might put out a survey. If you guys, have, you probably haven't done this yet, but there's always people who don't respond. If you're doing this on the phone, people go, no, I just don't want to, I don't want to answer your questions. Yeah. You have to vote. You have to vote. We were talking about. Uh, so this is this is talking about if someone's um, trying to predict how an election's going to go. They're saying, "Who are you going to vote for?" They're trying to get a theory of who's going to win the election based on what they're they're doing their surveys. Um, and there was another option that was listed here, and it was: Is there a language or cultural problem that could interfere with it? So if there is a particular group of people that might not be responding to your survey because of a language barrier. That could be an issue as well. Oh, that would be such a good one. Right. Anyway, so there are things to think about. Question five. New experiment. An experiment is to toss 10 coins and count the number of heads. This is simulated a hundred times and the results are shown in the table below. So we can have from zero heads all the way through to 10 heads. Then we have the frequency, this was simulated. So this is the uh, results that came out. So five heads happened 23 times when you rolled the dice. And then they've worked out the, the F with the little R. Remember that's the relative frequency. How do you work out a relative frequency? You're taking the frequency, which for this one that I'm pointing at was the two was the frequency, and you're dividing it by the number of times that you do the experiment, which is 100. Okay, so two over 100 is how you get the 0 0.02. And the next one would have been six over 100, which is why it's 0 0.06. Okay, so that's how they've got all of those numbers in there. So it says, now imagine that the purpose of each simulation was to produce an estimate of the probability of tossing heads. That is a value of random variable. So there's my sample proportion. Note that this random variable has 11 values from zero all the way through to one. Because when we find these, remember that we're dividing the um, X value by the N, which in this case is going to be 10 for the 10 coins that we're using. Okay, so 1 over 10 is how we get the z in here. So it's 1 over 10. 1 was our original x value, and we're dividing it by 10 because there was 10 coins. And that's how we get those values across the top there. The relative frequencies is going to be dividing those values. Um, actually, not no, sorry. I don't need to do anything. I've already worked those out from above. So using the table above, I get 0, 0 0.02, 0 0.06, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.23, 0 0.17, 0 0.13, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, and 0. What does CF stand for? Cumulative frequency, very good. So this is cumulating the relative frequency. Cumulative relative frequency. Oh, a lot of big words in there, isn't there? Okay, so we're going to be adding up that relative frequency column as we go. So zero is the first score, so zero will be the first one. Then I add on the 0 0.02, so that's 0 0.02. Then I have 0 0.02 and I'm adding on the 0 0.06. So the next one is 0 0.08. Then add on the 0.15 and I get 0 0.23. Do you get the idea? Just adding on each number to get the cumulative frequency as we go along. So the next one should be 0 0.43, 0 0.66, 0 0.67, 0 0.68, 0 0.69, 0 0.70, 0 0.71, 0 0.72, 0 0.73, 0 0.74, 0 0.75, 0 0.76, 0 0.77, 0 0.78,
0 0.83, 0 0.96, 0 0.9. Oh, I can't see if that's, I think that's a 7. And then a 1, and then a 1. So, yeah, because you're adding on 0 0.01. The relative, that wasn't the total. The total is one. So the total, when you add those all up, is the one. The cumulative frequency, it's adding all those up, isn't it? Yeah, because so doing 10 divided by zero divided by that's just the That's just the relative frequency. That's not a cumulative thing. Okay, um, there's more that I had to do. It says complete the table showing the cumulative relative frequency. Um, and find the mean and the standard deviation. So we don't, I don't think we want to go through the whole big long process of doing the extra columns, the extra rows in the table. So how about we use our calculator to do it for some practice. So we're using those two rows there and you're going to use your calculators in your stats mode. You're going to have a try? Come on. Come on. So you calculate it in stats mode. So here we go. Actually, there's one up there. Go and get it. So you go mode two, one. And you bring up one, boys. Then you bring up your frequency column. So you go shift mode three, one to turn on the column. So we're putting in the, the P hat for my X row. What is it miss? Is it a variable? Is it A plus BX? Um, sorry, I was just typing in. Oh, okay. So you have to one for one variable to start with. Have you done that already? One? One? And it brings up one row? Yep. Then up press shift. Oh, it brings up two? Oh, good. Just type, type them in now. No. I'm you, gonna if you need to know this for the test, then you need to know how to do this for the test. Okay, so then we go and so type in all your X's in the first column and then go back and type in the relative frequency for the second column. So 0 0.02, 0 0.06. Do we finish it down? Um, zero. Okay. Yep. Got to get them all in there. Has everyone got them in? Oh, yeah. To get your results out, you press AC and have a panic. Ah, they're gone. And then you press shift one, four for variable. If you press two and equals, you get your mean, which is 0 0.482. So mean is 0 0.482. The standard deviation, you press shift one again, four for variable and three for standard deviation equals. Shift nine, you're going to clear it on me, are you? Okay, so that is equal to 0 0.170. If I do three decimal places. Okay, finished A, part B. Use binomial probability to calculate the cumulative probabilities of obtaining these values. You press AC. Yeah, I know. Then you press Shift Four. Yeah, because he's got the old, the other version of the calculator. Shift. Yeah. Then press Four, and then press Two for me. Three for deviation. Yeah. Okay, so we're using binomial probability now to calculate the cumulative probabilities of obtaining the values for our sample proportion, and then we're going to find the mean and the standard deviation of that. Okay, so um, we have our, it's filled in for us, our sample proportions across the top there. The probabilities of those, how are we going to find the probability? No idea how to do this. How many coins are we tossing? 10. And I want 
First of all, no successes. No. Ten. This is just for the sample. So we just go for one, one toss. For one toss, what is the probability? Um, we need to times that by a half to the power of not one. Ten. Okay. So this first one is zero point zero zero one. Then we're going to go to the next one and it'll be 10C1. And I will write them all down for you. So it's 0 0.010, 0 0.044, 0 0.117, 0 0.205, 0 0.246, 0 0.247, 0 0.044 and 0 0.010 and 0 0.001. To do a cumulative it means I have to add them up as I go along. So the first one is 0 0.001. Then I have to add on the 0 0.01 which is 0 0.011 then add on the 0.44 or 0 0.44, sorry. Don't forget the zero, it's very important. 0 0.055, yeah, and keep adding on the next number. Is everyone okay with that? Oh, thank you. Zero point nine 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 and one, which is good news when it reaches one. Okay, we need to find the mean and the standard deviation. This is a sample, remember, that we're doing here. So the mean for a sample is the same as the probability, and this is talking about the probability of getting ahead when you flip a coin. What is the probability of getting ahead? Half. So I don't need the table for that, that's just equal to the probability. The standard deviation for a sample is NPQ over N, square root of, so that's the square root of 10 times a half times a half over 10, which is the 10s cancel out, and you get 0 0.15811. That's way too many decimal places, but anyway. It would be square root of quarter. Go. Oh, wait, there's something you don't write that formula. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, the square root, yeah, sorry, that's why it's still working. You are. The square root is only on the top. There you go, that's better. That's why, because I was doing the same thing. Let me get rid of that square root sign from there too. Only should be on the top. There we go. There we go, that's better. Okay. They are not the same. Oh, what do you mean? These are the formulas that I went through at the beginning of the lesson for sample proportion. Okay, question C. Use the, oh, here it comes again. Use the normal approximation to the sample proportion distribution to calculate the cumulative probabilities of the sample proportion and find the mean and standard deviation. Apply the continuous correction. You remember all these words? Um, because n equals 10 is small, which means we need to use continuous correction. Okay. Oh, those look funny. They shouldn't look like that. Oh, that one should. So this one was a Z score. And that one was a Greek letter phi. Okay. So to find the mean and standard deviation, the mean 
of a the sample is still the same as what we worked out in the last question. Okay, you don't need to work out anything new here. So let's write that underneath. The mean is still going to be equal to 0 0.5 or a half. And the standard deviation is the 0 0.15811 that we worked out in part B. But now I have to change my sample proportions up here into Z scores using my Z score formula. And my Z score formula says that I take my score, but wait. Normally I would take my score and subtract my mean and then divide it by the standard deviation. That's the formula, so this is the formula. Um, but my continuity correction, what do we do for a continuity correction? We normally want to go half of a unit. Um, all right, look at, yeah, those p hat values are going up by 0.1, aren't they? So it's 0 0.05 that I need to, I'm going to add to each score. Okay, so maybe write that as a note. So p hat increases by 0 0.1. Therefore, we need to add 0 0.05 to each value because it's half of that, right? So for my first calculation, adding 0 0.05 on, I'll get 0 0.05. I'll subtract my mean, which is 0 0.5, and divide by my standard deviation, which is 0 0.15811. As a Z score, that comes out to be negative 2.85. You want me to tell you the rest now? No, so the next, is. for each one of, so for the point 0.1, you're just going to change that 0 0.05. That's the only number that's going to change each time. And it will become a 0 0.15. Okay, and this is, this is the list of results you should get. The mean and the standard deviation, they're the same as the last question. So that was the mean and standard deviation that we worked out back here. So it's just these ones. Yep, so they're the same. So we already worked those out. We already worked out the mean of the sample proportion in the last question. Okay, now here's super fun times. We need to find the Z scores that go with each of those. So I've rounded all of those to two decimal places. So now you're gonna to go to your table and we need to know what negative 2.85 is, which means we need to go to positive 2.85, 2.85 and I want to find the small, I'm going to have to read off the smaller proportion number because I want the number that's on the left of that. Does that make sense? So negative, okay, so uh, this is my my normal distribution here like this. A negative, if I want to know the negative 2.85, I'm actually finding the positive 2.85 and I'm, I really want that part there, but if I just say five minutes, that would be the same as that part on that side. Lovely symmetry of our normal curve, right? So to the, the, the smaller portion, reading on the table, has anyone read it off? You can. I've got it, but I just don't want to tell you everything and have you not know how to work it out. You're very good. Okay. And then you have this straight off the table here. Look at my table. Yes, I'm doing the smaller portion because the minus 2.8, that was what this, this green diagram over here was about. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, because our tables never have any negative values. So we just use symmetry and go, let's find the positive one and find the smaller portion on the upper side. Try the next one. Do it because we're going to do it again. Oh, so the Z score is minus 2.85. And I want to know how many scores or what proportion of scores are up to there or less than there. Um, then you will, okay, so let's do the smaller one. Let's do the negative ones first. So we'll get, these other ones will be 0 0.0136, 0 0.0511, 5. Yep, 0 0.0511, and then 0 0.1711, 0 0.3745. And then we hit the positive one. So yes, so yes. So read off 0 0.32. Yes, good. And the next one is 0 0.8289. 0 0.9429, 0 0.9864, 0 0.9978. Sorry, this is so I need bigger boxes here. 0 0.9997. This question is ridiculously big, guys. Ridiculously big that we're having to do so much for one question. Okay, so um once we have found all of that, the very last thing to do says on one graph, <laughs> one graph, we need to draw the cumulative relative frequency, which is what we were asked to do in part A. Okay, so that's the answer to part A that I want to draw there. Then I want to draw the cumulative probability polygon, which is what we were asked to do in part B. And then the CDF cumulative, um, that's the last one that we did. Yep, distribution. That's from part C. So this one here, that is part D. So we are wanting to draw our tables basically for A, or not D, sorry, there's no D, C. We wanted to draw our results for our tables in A, B, and C. So across the bottom, for all three of them, it is going to be our P hat that is across the bottom. Okay, so that goes all the way up to one. So if we go up 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and then one. And now we get to draw, and I don't want to be scrolling backwards and forwards, so if you hold your book that out so you can see the table. Um, for our table in A, sketching the cumulative frequency means we're sketching that bottom row. Okay, so at zero, we're at zero. Then at point one, it's zero. Actually, I need a scale here. Um, we're going up by point ones because our total at the end is one again. Point two, point three. Okay, so zero point zero two, which is going to be slightly above that. Zero point zero eight. Zero point two three. Zero point four three. Zero point six six. 0 0.83, 0 0.96, 0 0.97, and then 1, and then 1. And if you carefully draw the little line segments in there,
Okay, so that is my blue pen over here. This is my cumulative frequency polygon. Okay, so that's sketching table A. Now I'm going to change colors. Yeah, it's zero. Yeah. Now I'm going to sketch the second graph, which is from table B. And the first value is 0 0.01. So it is slightly above the other one. 0 0.011. Uh, that's below because I had 0 0.08. Then 0 0.05, that's about there. 0 0.17, 0 0.38, 0 0.623. Oh, I think that was 0 0.66, so it's going to be underneath that one. 0 0.8. Um, this should be underneath still, even though I think mine a little bit too squished up here, but anyway, 0 0.95, 945, 9. So what you can see is they're super close together. Small differences, but very, very similar results that we're getting out of this. And so that red one is my cumulative probability polygon. Um, so that was one we did with binomial. The binomial formula to get that polygon. And then finally, the last one that we're going to draw is using the normal distribution. And again, it's really similar again. You can hardly tell them apart. So the last one is 0 0.002. So it is slightly above up here, but they're so close together, it's hard to tell. Um, 0.05 is that between zero five down here and then zero point one seven is point three seven. Five is 0.62. Oh, they're all about the same thing. They're all there in the middle. And 0.83. It's slightly above those other ones. 0 0.7, 0 0.94. 0 oh, I can't even tell these things apart. They're so close together. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, they all get up, or oh, this one this one doesn't actually quite get to one at the end. It's just below the one. Yeah, so the point is, using these three methods, you pretty much get the same result, which is why they're all such good ways of calculating, depending on the situation that you're in. I've got a few questions, but let's finish them. <laughs> no, that's it. Okay, I'll finish it. <laughs>